morning and welcome to the Marquette City Commission meeting for Monday, June 11th, 2012. Could you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, City Clerk, do you want to call roll, please? Yes, Your Honor. Mayor Pro Tem DiPietro? Here. Commissioner Nimi? Here. Commissioner Ryan? Here. Commissioner St. Ange? Here. Commissioner Snyder? Here. Commissioner Stonehouse? Here. And Mayor Kivala? Here. All right, Commissioners, any changes to the agenda? Commissioner Nimi? Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to add an item tonight to uh, a discussion on the concerns of the Superior Land Soccer Association uh, regarding the, the fees. All right, we have a motion. Commissioner uh, Ryan had his hand up first. I'll support the motion. All right, we'll add that as number nine. Any other changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Commissioner Ryan? Move we approve the agenda as amended. Thank you. Do we have support? Commissioner DiPietro supports. All in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The only announcement I've got is the City of Marquette received a Certificate of Appreciation from the Upper Peninsula Labor Management Council. Uh, and this is in recognition of the generous support of the For Unity Sponsor Program. So I just wanted to show that off and uh, thank the Upper <laughs> Peninsula Labor Management Council for the recognition. Uh, I don't have any other announcements. We've got a pretty loaded docket, so we'll get it right into our first item. Uh, first up is a public hearing on single lot special assessment roll number 577. City Clerk, do you want to read the background? Thank you, Your Honor. Background, Chapter 40, Section 40.21 of the City Code requires that when an Im improvement shall have been made uh, by the City upon or in respect to any single premises, the expense of which is chargeable against such premises and the owner thereof under the provisions of this chapter and is not of that class required to be prorated among several lots and parcels of, la of land in a special assessment district in, in a, excuse me, an account of the cost to be charged to the owner shall be reported to the city treasurer who shall immediately bill the owner if known. The city code further requires that when the city treasurer determines that a number of properties have had outstanding bills for a sufficient time, the treasurer shall notify the city assessor who shall prepare a single lot assessment roll and schedule public hearing before the city commission on that roll. Affected property owners will receive notification of the time and place of the hearing in accordance with section 40.21 of the city code. Fiscal effect, $958.91 plus accruing interest and penalties. Recommendation following the public hearing, confirm single lot special assessment roll number 577 and authorize the mayor to sign the warrant. Alternatives as determined by the commission. All right, thank you. And we just received a, a memo uh, just stating some up updated, oh, sorry, wrong one, never mind. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Uh, okay, this is a public hearing, so anyone wishing to address the commission on this issue could stand at the lectern and give your name and address. Anyone? Okay, seeing none, we will go to the commission. Uh, what is your pleasure? Commissioner Ryan? I'd like to move we confirm the single lot special assessment roll number 577 and authorize the mayor to sign the warrant. All right, do we have support Commissioner Stonehouse? Um, I uh, support that motion. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan? Well, the clerk explained what, what's happening. These are re repairs or uh, made, made to properties at the city's expense, and the owners are billed for those charges and have not paid them, and this is the list of people that fall under that category, and this is our attempt to uh, collect. So, All right. appropriate. Any additional comments? Seeing none, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Next up, we've got a presentation on a possible brown brownfield site, uh, 857 West Washington Street by Mr. Robert Mahaney of the Radia Group. 
And we're going to start with uh, Sherry Davies from the Brownfield. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening on behalf of the Brownfield Authority. I want to thank the Honorable Mayor and the members of the City Commission, staff and guests. We have a tremendously exciting project that I'm hoping that when you hear about it, that tomorrow night um, we're going to be above the fold and uh, it's going to be uh, with a lot of excitement on the project that we're going to introduce. Um, we have great support. It, it, this is passed by our Brownfield Authority. They're tremendously excited about it, and we have several of our board members here, including our chair. Um, we are here to ask for a public hearing on June 25th so that we can keep moving forward on this project. And I will introduce you to Mac McClellan, the Brownfield Authority consultant, who is going to provide you with some detail. And first, I'm going to introduce Mr. Bob Mahaney of the, of the Viridia Group. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you, City Commission members. Thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. Um, I just want to start out by uh, pointing out that we've, uh, we first met with uh, the Brownfield Authority and, and uh, the Brownfield Chair back in, I believe, December of uh, last year and have been working with city staff, uh, with uh, City Manager Vita as well, uh, to get to this point. Uh, it's, uh, we really appreciate all the help and support that we've received along the way. It's been a, a very uh, a valuable experience and uh, a very good learning experience as well. Um, I'm going to start with. Uh, am I uh, showing up, Mac? Yeah. Okay. Oh. I should forewarn you that you're dealing with a technologically challenged person here. Okay, just uh, very quickly, I think most of you. Uh, are familiar with Viridia Group, but uh, uh, for those that aren't, or for the audience, uh, Viridia, we are a commercial real estate development group uh, company based in Marquette, uh, fully integrated in all aspects of development uh, from Greenfield um, and Brownfield up to and through uh, uh, ownership and management of properties. Uh, over uh, its history, Viridia and its affiliates uh, and its predecessors have completed a a little over 40 projects at about uh, 500,000 square feet and about 75 million in value today. Uh, we work throughout the upper Midwest, but primarily in Marquette, I would say well over half of our portfolio has been developed here in Marquette. Just a couple of examples of some of the projects that we've done. Here's, here's a couple uh, that you might be familiar with uh, and some lovely before photos and some uh, hopefully more lovely after photos. Uh, the Third Street Border Grill is there on the top, and then on the bottom is uh, the building uh, at Washington and Third uh, that I believe uh, many of you are familiar with. Some of the other projects, just to quickly highlight some of the projects we've done in the city of Marquette in the past, the Harbor Hills Office Park was a greenfield project that actually at one time was city-owned property that we ended up in control of. And uh, when we took control, we developed uh, the office park up there that has three buildings right now, uh, approximately uh, 20 to 25,000 square feet housing, uh, excuse me, housing uh, a variety of uh, tenants. Um, 989 and 925 West Washington is, I think, a, a, a good example. This was uh, when we acquired this property, it was the former Olson Motors or what a lot of folks around town called the, the old Ford garage. And, uh, we uh, basically gutted that building, the existing building, turned it into office space, and then we took the adjoining uh, gravel lot and converted that into uh, another office building, and that's been a very successful project for us. 153 is the Washington 3rd building, and 800 North 3rd is the uh, Board of Grill. Um, <clears throat> I think we wanted to start out uh, with uh, trying to address right up front what we see in our opinion at least, is what uh, benefits would uh, come to the city through this project that we're presenting to you tonight. Um, first of all, the, the site, I'm gonna jump forward if I dare. Here's the current site. Um, and I'm told if I click this three times, you'll get three photos. You can see, I think everybody's familiar with the bakery site. 
It has been shut down. It was closed by Sara Lee in 2009, June of 2009, I believe. Uh, it sat vacant for three years. When Sara Lee moved out, they basically moved everything out. Uh, the building has structural deficiencies. Um, it has, uh, it needs a new roof, uh, uh, among other things. It's uh, been uh, determined by the city assessor to be a functionally obsolete building, or yeah, uh, building, I guess the property is not functionally obsolete in our opinion. It has potential. Um, we really believe that, uh, going to my second bullet point here, that this project can really be the catalyst for additional development along Washington Street, especially between the bakery site and extending into what people traditionally view as downtown Marquette. We think it can actually redefine downtown Marquette, and I hope when you see our vision that uh, you, might, uh, you might buy into that concept. Um, obviously, it has the potential to, to expand the city's tax base, and we're going to go into that uh, in more detail further in our presentation. Our fourth bullet point, attract new businesses. For our phase one building, we have it uh, almost fully pre-leased. Right now, uh, tenants would include a uh, financial institution that would take the first two floors, um, a professional services firm that would be moving uh, and opening offices here from out of state. Um, and uh, we would be moving our own offices uh, into this building as well. Uh, we have been uh, hiring a few more people and we need more space and we have plans to hire more. So that all leads to job creation. By our estimate uh, today, uh, we expect phase one alone to create about 15 to 20 jobs, uh, permanent jobs, and a number of these jobs are good, are what I believe are good jobs, college degree required jobs uh, um, with uh, good benefits and uh, compensation. I think one of the key benefits here is uh, this next one. This is a unique site in that, in a conventional sense, the topography is challenging, but when we worked with our architect, uh, Majewski uh, and Associates, um, we came up with a plan that actually took that problem, which is the topography, and turned it into a positive, and allowed us to uh, achieve a high-density, mixed-use uh, development here, as you'll see shortly. The last point that I want to make as far as benefits to the city in our view is we've been having extensive discussions with uh, MEDC. They've just come out with some new uh, funding programs. Uh, the one that uh, we're in discussions with them about is the uh, Community Revitalization Program or CRP that allows for uh, up to a million dollar grant and a combination of grants or loans uh, up to 25 percent of the project's total cost. And as you'll see, uh, with this project, it has a lot of potential, but in order to achieve that potential, it has a lot of infrastructure cost. <clears throat> so here again is the current use, and if you look carefully in that slide, you'll see the pigeons flying about. We have excellent pigeon habitat right now. This is the site plan. Uh, I'll just very briefly touch on this and uh, be happy to answer any questions when we get to that point. Um, the first building, uh, this, uh, the top is north. Of course, you'll see Lincoln Avenue and the intersection of Washington Avenue. Um, we really are dealing with two streetscapes here, if you will, and we're trying to take advantage and maximize both of those streetscapes. There's uh, the obvious one, Washington Street, but also on the south uh, boundary, we have the linear park or the bike path. And the idea behind this development and this siting of the buildings is to maximize and invite the public in as much as possible into this, create sort of an urban courtyard feel, and provide some good walkability linkage, if you will, between the neighborhoods to the north of Washington down to the bike path. Uh, because this is a mixed-use uh, development that will have retail and restaurant and uh, other, uh, other similar businesses that uh, we'll be trying to draw on the general public. It only makes sense to do that. Um, the site's location actually, uh, actually uh, works very well for this. I want to point out the uses of the buildings, the planned uses right now, and I want to emphasize that we have a lot of flexibility with these buildings with the exception of the first building, which we already have pre-leased. The first building is the one in the northwest corner. 
what we call our phase one building, a little over 23,000 square feet, three stories. Um, you'll see it has a, a drive-through banking facility on the south side. Uh, if we go to the uh, northeast corner, that's our phase two building, it's going to be uh, similar in size, probably about 23,000 square feet. Plans for that building right now are a combination of retail, restaurant, office. We really have a lot of flexibility. We're in discussions right now with a number of parties that have expressed interest in, um, in locating their businesses there. The third and fourth phase buildings, um, the plans for those, and, and these can be switched around, so I don't want to get locked into you know, too many specifics as far as location. But phase three and four can either be done in separate phases or it can be done all together. The centerpiece is this, uh, this atrium that would be a, uh, a winter garden in the, in the winter um, and provide for that linkage between uh, Washington Avenue and the bike path um, as well as linkage on either side. Uh, plans for this building are residential. Uh, I would say probably close to 50% of the total square footage will end up being residential, at, at least uh, that is our plan today. Uh, retail and uh, the like on the ground floors and also office or possibly lodging uh, on the other floors. This is a uh, sort of the bird's eye view if we were to do the full build out and uh, to give you a, more of a 3D perspective if you will. And the building closest to you here is the phase one building. Um, these don't have the architectural elements as you'll see in the next slide, this is the phase one building, uh, the current uh, um, schematic of that building. One of the things that we're trying to do to emphasize the connectivity to downtown Marquette with, uh, with our architectural design is to take some of the wonderful architectural elements that we have in our historic buildings here in town and try to tie some of those in. Hence you see the, you know, the, uh, the curved uh, corners on this building reminiscent of the Savings Bank building. Um, So that gets me to uh, probably the key question on everyone's mind is why do we need brownfield support? If we look at the master plan, the city's master plan, it calls for high density development in locations such as this one, uh, you know, a heavy commercial corridor. If we're going to do a high density development, the only way that it's possible to do that is with a parking structure. And our plans call for uh, underground parking basically underneath that phase three and phase four building that will provide for access into all buildings, all four buildings. In order to achieve uh, that parking, we'd need a, I think we uh, require a little over 400 parking spaces for this type of square footage. So in order to, uh, there's no way we can get 400 parking spaces going horizontally on the, on the surface. Um, the only way we can achieve that is by going vertically, and that's where the topography really works in our favor, because if you're familiar with the, with the bakery site, it drops off almost 20 feet from Washington Street down to the back area where they used to, uh, where it's uh, paved asphalt in the back. So we can take that uh, topographical change and actually work it to our advantage and use that to put our parking underground. Um, but when we add uh, a parking structure of any type, in our market, uh, it is impossible to recapture those costs uh, through, higher, through generating higher revenues, i.e. higher lease rates. Um, a, the rule of thumb for a parking stall is the low, low end I've heard is 15,000, the high end is uh, 22,000. And I think in the Brownfield plan, they take a worst case scenario uh, and, and those costs were developed with our construction manager um, and use 21,900 as a rule of thumb per stall. Um, we think that multi-level parking really can spur uh, uh, the, a successful development. Uh, in my own personal experience uh, as a property owner downtown, uh, the building at Washington Third, um, having the uh, parking deck just to the north of Washington Street certainly has been a benefit and helped us attract tenants. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that in our plan, we're not requesting any city bond financing for this brownfield. Um, and furthermore, uh, we're not looking for ongoing public operating funds to support it. 
just tried to draw up a very simple uh, summation of the tax impact with and without a brownfield. Um, without a brownfield, if we were to assume that we uh, constructed only the phase one building, the, the total uh, incremental tax, is it incremental or total tax revenue? Total tax revenue over 30 years would be just over 4.5 million. If we have the brownfield support over those 30 years, um, we'd have $11.8 million plus we would have an additional $3, point, uh, $3 million almost going into the local site remediation revolving fund that the city could use for projects such as Cliffs, Cliffs Dow or other um, uh, sites of, the, of that ilk. And I believe that concludes my uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Mac. Thank you, Bob. Welcome back, Mac. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mac McClellan with Outwell Mobby. I'm the consultant for the Marquette Brownfield Redevelopment Authority and uh, happy to be back once again. Got a little bit of a switch here for the presentation. And uh, I have about a um, two hour presentation on the Brownfield plan. Oh, maybe. Great, you can start after this meeting. Okay, great. Good, good deal. I'll get rolling then a little bit later then. So, great. One of the um, uh, issues, in, and Bob talked a little bit about the advantages to the city, but one of the requirements of Act 3D1 is for the community in the city to find a public purpose uh, for the project as well. And those are listed as well, but uh, that's the consideration that you have is what is the public purpose for this project. We've identified that in increased investment in tax base, additional employment, some downtown living opportunities. The spin-off redevelopment uh, opportunities, I think everyone can see that this kind of investment in this area can really stimulate some opportunities uh, and as well probably help stimulate some interest in the roundhouse property that's uh, uh, close by uh, this particular piece. Cleans up the, the uh, blighted site, maximizes that site potential, and as Bob said, expands the boundaries of downtown. So that's something that you need to consider as the public purpose for this, uh, for this brownfield project. I'm just going to talk briefly about what brownfield tax increment financing is. I think you guys are all familiar with it, but wanted to go through it uh, once again. It provides reimbursement for eligible activities, and I'll define those in a moment, on eligible property through the capture of increased taxes due to that additional private investment on that particular piece of property. So what's unique about this as opposed to a DDA is that only that particular piece of property is the one that generates the taxes in which you can reimburse those taxes. It's not a district, it's only that particular piece of property is a unique feature to that. And you only reimburse to the amount of eligible activities actually spent on the property. It's not a 30-year plan where you generate revenues and then decide what to do with those revenues. You approve all of those activities up front, and then they're only reimbursed on the actual expenses that are made based on invoices submitted to the Brownfield Authority. The idea, the whole idea of Brownfield redevelopment and why this act was passed in 1996 is to level the playing field between greenfield and brownfield sites. None of the costs that are involved here generally would be necessary in a greenfield site outside of the city. Cities were finding that in the difficulty and the challenges and these extra additional costs that were to, to redevelop these properties that, that people were moving outside of town. So this is really an economic development tool to stimulate investment in downtown and built communities and utilize existing infrastructure. The great part about it is it's not, we're not carving up an existing revenue pie we're really expanding that revenue pie, generating new taxes uh, for, uh, for the uh, opportunity because of that private investment. And then a slice of that pie is taken off to reimburse those extraordinary costs. So we're expanding that pie and then taking a portion of that pie to reimburse those extraordinary costs. Without that reimbursement, the project can't move forward. As Bob said in his example, without any of the dollars, they could only do phase one, build that one area and have surface parking that would be available. So it limits that opportunity. Uh, as well. And just as a little bit of a breakdown, it also leverages some additional dollars, state dollars and other local dollars as well. The city taxes are about 35% of the total tax bill. So with every investment that the city makes, you're leveraging two other dollars uh, as well. There's, uh, for eligible property, there's three kinds of eligible property. One is contaminated property, blighted property, or functionally obsolete, which means it can essentially, the functionally obsolete is, means it can no longer be used for its intended purpose. Um, in this case, um, uh, you have to have a declaration of functional obsolescence and a level three or four assessor needs to identify that and provide an affidavit. Uh, Susan Bovin, the city assessor, a level three assessor has identified this as a functionally obsolete uh, property qualifying under the act. There's two types of brownfield uh, activities. 
The first is environmental activities for a contaminated site to deal with the investigation, any protection, and any remediation, any of the environmental uh, issues that are on that site. And the second part is what I call developmental activities. That includes lead and asbestos abatement and demolition for all Michigan communities. But for select Michigan communities, there's about 103 in the state, including the city of Marquette, there are expanded eligible activities, including site preparation and infrastructure. There was an idea that the act was changed in 2000 to say we really want to focus on these core communities, these qualified local governmental units, and focus additional activities in these areas to stimulate investment in those core communities, of which Marquette is one. The approach that we do when we put together the Brownfield Plan, I prepare the Brownfield Plan on behalf of the Brownfield Authority. It is a document of the authority, approved by the authority and approved by the commission as well, is we use conservative estimates. We asked the developer to identify what those costs are, take a look at those, but we've used conservative estimates all the way through these because we don't want to be surprised with something. So the eligible activity costs that are included within the plan are high. They cannot go above that level and, and they will go below that level. Uh, so we've used a very high estimate for the eligible activity costs. Um, the build out that has been uh, suggested in the plan is relatively long, each of those phases in about every two years. Um, Bob has mentioned uh, in the past or at the Brownfield Authority meeting that they've already got some interest in the second phase of the project and fully anticipate that to, to increase. So that increases the amount of taxes quicker and reduces that payout period as well. So those eligible activities, if they're lower or the build out is higher, that reduces the length of time. In addition, we've used the taxable value for the property of construction costs. And I think everybody who builds a home hopes that their value is higher than that construction cost. We've tried to use a conservative value for that construction cost as well. If that's higher, if those taxable values are higher, again, the eligible activities are paid off more quickly. Um, this is in your brownfield plan. I won't go to, or in the packet of information that's included in there. We did include some NDEQ eligible activities. Even though this site is not contaminated or hasn't been identified as contaminated, in an industrial uh, facility that's been operated since 1938, there's a strong possibility there might be something, uh, some surprises as they start digging around on the site. So we've provided some, again, some contingencies, some opportunities. This may not even be necessary uh, in this case. We've included the four major areas, lead and asbestos abatement and demolition, the larger ticket items, site preparation and infrastructure, and I'll describe those in a little bit more detail. The site preparation costs include those extraordinary costs to try and redevelop that site, the challenges to that site, to deal with the issues, to deal with the retaining walls that are necessary, excavation for underground parking to include a green stormwater uh, management system uh, to be able to fil filter on that area and to protect the public infrastructure along Washington Street as that project is being developed to make certain that those uh, uh, costs are included and that, that those uh, public infrastructure is protected. The infrastructure elements here um, there is uh, included in the plan were uh, improvements to Lincoln and Washington intersection. Uh, certainly there's an opportunity there and the funds generated by the private development will be able to pay off those costs as well, including streetscapes on Washington uh, Street and the bike path as well, a connection to that bike path and the underground parking uh, that was uh, noted as well. Just to give you a little graphic example of how the numbers work, um, this occurs if there's no improvement on the property uh, in that case, if, if there isn't any investment on the property as well. And I should relate that the property taxes under the Brownfield Plan are frozen, and so there isn't any loss of revenues for local communities. Those taxes that are still being generated on the property still go back to the taxing jurisdictions. But we're just talking about capturing the increased incremental taxes. This kind of shows how the build-out occurs of the Phase 1. And this will show you that if this Phase 1 is the only thing that can be built, those taxes remain at a relatively low level. Over a two year period, incrementing on, incrementally uh, improving on phase two, uh, phase three, and then finally over a period of about eight years, uh, phase four is built out and the project is, is fully built out. After this project is fully built out, based on the conservative estimates that we had, estimated about 12 years uh, for payback. The total plan is longer, but it takes a while for the project to be built out uh, and to do that. After that time period, there's an opportunity for a capture of a local site remediation fund, as Bob mentioned. We've included the maximum capable for that, and it generates about $3 million that the Brownfield Authority and the city can allocate towards projects throughout the community to address any of these issues or have a fund in place, basically, to help uh, economic development tool to help uh, address those problems. That's what's been funding Cliffs Dow, is uh, um, that local site remediation fund. 
And then after that period of time, all of the taxes go back to the taxing jurisdictions. So this kind of plan talks about 30 years because that's what the act says, but all of those taxes continue to accrue throughout the life of the, pro throughout the, life of the property. Estimated to be about a 75 year uh, uh, development and so once this uh, tax ends or once this 30 year period ends, those taxes continue to accrue uh, at a level of about $1.3 million, $1.4 million per year when it currently generates about $11,000 uh, in taxes. The schedule that's been proposed is uh, uh, that the Brownfield, the Brownfield Authority reviewed and approved the Brownfield Plan and Act 3D1 work plan uh, at their meeting on June 7th. We're introducing the project here tonight and requesting a public hearing and consideration of the Brownfield Plan at your next June 25th meeting. Um, and then there also is a development agreement uh, which outlines the roles and responsibilities of all the parties um, to navigate and negotiate through that through the month of June and bring that back to the authority, Brownfield Authority on July 12th and consideration to the city commission on July 30th. That plan, in order to capture state taxes, we have to send that Act 3D1 work plan down to the state and uh, we're hoping that they consider that on August 22nd if we decide to proceed with the project. So hopefully that's a little less than two hours and a brief summary of the Brownfield activities. And I think that Sherry and Bob and I are happy to answer any questions you may have. All right. I'm sorry, did you have a wrap up coming? Or? Okay. Um, at this point, Don, do you have a question? No, no. Okay. Um, why don't we, if we have questions, we'll bring you up back when we discuss this uh, at the next agenda item. I think we've got you down at uh, number six, if that's okay. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we've got another presentation uh, on City Archives by Marcus Robbins, uh, University Archivist for Northern Michigan University. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. Now for something completely different and incredibly mundane. <laughs> Compared to this project that we just saw. If you'll just bear with me for a moment here. I'm gonna hook up. You bet. Dave. I'm connected, Dave. Ah, there we go. Um, as you may remember, about a year ago, uh, you voted to uh, support a project to digitally convert uh, well over 100 years of city commission minutes. And I'm here to announce or to report back and tell you that the project's completed and the online uh, material is now available to the public. This is the website. You can't see it too well, I guess, from here. Uh, we're still working on some tweaking some things. But the project essentially involved taking all of the city commission minutes from 18, starting with 1868, those are the ones that survive, 1868 all the way up to the present. And they are now available digitally online to the public free of charge from this website. We also did the same thing with the county commission minutes uh, beginning in 1852 all the way up to the present. From this website, you can link to a, to a finding aid that will take you to the different years and volumes within, the, within the, the minutes. You can also link to the current minutes of the commission, both the city and the county. And then we have a nifty little timeline here that also provides researchers with um, some of the major historical events in the city's and the county's history that they can follow along as they do their research on the minutes. And I'm gonna leave it right here in 1868, you can see when the minutes started, uh, was a major fire in Marquette, which I think many of you are aware of. It burned down pretty much all of the downtown area, which at that time was on Barraga Street, where the Children's Museum is. When a member of the public then clicks on one of the finding aids, it will take them to, and I went ahead and downloaded this already, to the actual minutes. And here you can see, this is the first page from the minutes of 1868, and you can see it was referred to as the village of Marquette. An individual can then page down, and it's very difficult, well, it's better to see there than I thought. Here you can see the minutes for June 13th, which is only a few days from now, 1868. And this is actually just a few days after the fire, and that devastated downtown. And you can see the first ordinance that was passed was be it, be it ordained or yeah, ordained by the commission, common C council of the village of Marquette that no wooden building shall be hereafter erected within the village, of the, of, of the, of the village area. 
And so you can imagine that that would be their first ordinance. And then if what follows in the set of minutes are several people petitioning to build some temporary wooden structures uh, <laughs> in order to get their businesses back up and running. But as you can see, this is the first, this is the first, it, it, what will appear to the public are the actual minutes. Um, the actual minutes themselves are in a climate controlled, acid free, secure location in the archives and actually will never be touched from now on because people can, can actually visit it from here. Um, let's see if I got everything. So this is the completion of the project that you funded. I wanted to report back to you and let you know that it's available. We will now begin publicity, active publicity campaign to get the word out uh, to as many people as possible through the media, the press, everything we can do, um, and continue to do that so that as many people in public. This will allow individuals from all over the world to do actually substantial research in a component of Upper Peninsula history, history of Marquette. Are there any questions? Questions at all? About this project? Again, I, I want to thank you very, very much for your support of this project, and I hope that you'll find it very satisfactory if you get a chance to look at it. Oh, we've got one quick question here. Commissioner Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Robbins, did, did the county also provide you some yes, level of support? Yes, the county also provided an equal but amount of support uh, for the project. And this is what the finding aid, by the way, looks like. It gives background information, uh, timeline, and uh, restrictions on use, a lot of information about the collection. Here's where you would click on the links to the different, in, in, in different materials. Well, Commissioner Stonehouse, microphone. He's got a loud voice, though. So, you know. <laughs> no, we need to do it that way. Uh, Marcus, this is 1868 to the present, right? Right. Uh, we, we took everything that was available in hard copy and then meshed it where, where Dave now is already is currently doing the minutes digitally right now. So is there any right anything in the works then to continue the present into the future? That's what Dave's working on right now. They're currently being, I think Excellent. they're you're, you're, they're being created digitally, born digitally, isn't that right, Dave? Yeah. Correct. But I mean, then that be, can become a linkage to what you've already Well, found. we are linked right now to the, uh, if you go to back to the, uh, and you click here, this takes you to where the current minutes are. Great, thank you. So someone from that page. Yeah. Outstanding job. Um, I'm just the kind of geek that's going to get on tonight and start <laughs> looking at some of this stuff. Of so right. yeah, okay. outstanding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for welcome. coming. Thank tonight. you very much. Okay, next up, we've got boards and committees. Uh, first thing we need to do is welcome our newest member, Jacob Feather. If you could please meet me at the lectern. <coughs> uh, Jacob here is the newest member of the traffic and advisor or traffic and parking advisory committee so Jacob on behalf of the city commission I'd like to thank you for your service to the city of Marquette we've got a city of Marquette pin for you and uh, we're excited to have you on board so thank you all right thanks All right, we've got a couple reappointments to consider. Uh, first one is Colin Sesternino, Arts and Culture Advisory Committee for a term ending 6115, and Emily Lanktot, Arts and Culture Advisory Committee for a term ending 6115. Commissioners? Commissioner Ryan? I would move we appoint Colin Sesternino to the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee for a term ending 6115 and Emily Langto to the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee for a term ending 6115. All right, thank you. Do we have support? Commissioner Schneider. Uh, any comments, uh, Commissioner Ryan? Just as always, we're glad these are people who are volunteering, stepping forward, and we appreciate their willingness to get involved. Thank you. Commissioner Schneider, any comments? No, no additional comments. Any additional? All in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next up is public comment. Comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Citizens may reserve time to speak on agenda items. This may result in the item being moved up on the agenda at the mayor's discretion. And again, if you could state your name and address for the record. 
Uh, Bob Anderson, uh, 810 West Magnetic, City of Marquette. Want to reserve comments for the, uh, I think it's agenda number nine. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Jim Mackey, 806 South Lake Street uh, here in Marquette. I'd like to reserve comments on, I believe it's agenda number nine also. All right, thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the commission? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment. Move, uh, let's get through the consent agenda if you <coughs> could, City Clerk, and I know you've got uh, a correction on the minutes. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, item A is the uh, special me meeting minutes of June 6, 2012 commission meeting. We had the May 29th regular meeting minutes, which was approved at the special meeting prior. So, uh, so item A then uh, becomes the minutes to be considered are June 6, 2012. That was they were the right minutes were in the packet. It just was wrong on the agenda cover. Item B, approve the total bills payable in the amount of $484,789.20. Item C, award the bid for industrial painting services at the water filtration plant to Superior Painting Incorporated of Marquette in an amount not to exceed $41,140, being the lowest bid and meeting specifications. And item D, award a contract for sanitary sewer uh, sewer main slip lining to in situ form technologies USA incorporated in the amount of three hundred forty two thousand three hundred two dollars at unit prices bid All right, thank you Commissioners what's your pleasure Commissioner DePietro? Thank you your, your honor. I'd like to uh, Move that we approve the consent agenda a B C and D. Thank you your honor. Can we uh, just uh, Exclude one bill on the bills payable for Commissioner Stonehouse. Yeah, we have a bill for Commissioner Stonehouse, a reimbursement of 5715. Could would you be willing to amend your motion to include all but that? Yes, I will amend that. Okay. We have support, Commissioner Ryan. I'll support the motion. All right. Uh, any comments? Seeing none. All in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed. Motion carries, and then we need a motion. Commissioner Ryan? I move we approve the expense reimbursement for Commissioner Stonehouse in the amount of $57 and 15. 15 cents. Yep. Support. Thank you, and support by Commissioner DePietro. Any comments? All in favor, say yes. 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 Motion carries. One abstention. You show one abstention. Oh, with one abstention. <laughs> abstention, I'm sorry. Commissioner Stonehouse. Um, now we're to new business, and why don't we move up uh, number nine? We've got a couple people here to speak on that issue, uh, and that is in regards to the soccer fees. Um, Commissioner Nimi, you asked to put this on the agenda. Do you want to just say a couple of words before we? Well, we'd received, uh, I think we all received letters from the, the soccer, Superior Soccer Association, and they had concerns about the fee. We increased fee from 60 to $115 per team uh, during budget sessions, and I think we doubled the per field fee. Um, I guess I'd let them address us, and then we, we can discuss it and, and uh, take whatever action might, uh, might uh, develop. All right. We have two folks here to discuss. Bob, do you want to go first? It, uh, a little bit out of character tonight. Usually we're giving you checks <laughs> the last 10 years uh, every year in a row. But our, our request this evening is to ask the commission to uh, rescind an earlier action that uh, almost doubled the per team user fee from uh, the $60 to $115 per team. Here's the reasons that we believe that this fee increase is unfair, unreasonable. Well, as you know, uh, we have helped uh, to raise, along with, uh, in partnership with this city and many other groups, uh, Kaufman, uh, Shiras, Frazier, uh, the state, over $1 million to create the best soccer fields 
and bathrooms in the whole UP. No other uh, user group, uh, sports user group, has raised that much money, that has spent that much time and that much effort into giving the city uh, the jewel of facilities that we have been able uh, to do. Second reason that we think uh, that perhaps you did not consider our investment when you tried to increase the fees is that since the fields were built over 10 years ago, the city has already imposed three fee increases in the last 10 years. Uh, our letter only mentioned uh, two. I forgot to mention there's one other fee increase. First one, of course, was back when the fields were built, the original cost was $50 per team. Now uh, it was $60. Uh, that would be, you know, one increase. But a second uh, increase was a little bit of a hidden one in that we uh, learned uh, through the development of soccer uh, on a national basis that for the younger divisions, you had to break your teams down from 12 members to eight or seven members. And so that's what we did uh, seven, eight years ago. And in doing that, that increased the number of teams, didn't increase the number of youth, uh, which usually for us is between uh, 900 or 950 youth uh, that we do service. And so because of the increased number of teams, we've had a cost increase by, by, while at the same time having the same number of, of youth. Uh, the city imposed a additional fee increase just two years ago on a per game uh, uh, that was imposed on us. That uh, created an additional almost $2,000 uh, a year uh, for that. Uh, these um, fee increases we willingly uh, accepted, acquiesced in. We didn't have a problem uh, in that, even though at the same time we, of course, were trying to save as much money as we could uh, to be able to pay back that uh, debt, which from the second uh, project uh, was well over seventy, eighty thousand dollars, and as you now is down, as you know now, is down to twenty-four thousand dollars. The uh, third reason why we think it's unfair is because we believe that cost recovery should not be the only criteria for managing youth sporting facilities. We believe that our future is in our youth, and providing them with healthy activities helps to keep them off the street. This should be a function of all municipal governments. We also believe that the vast majority of city residents, taxpayers, do want a small tiny fraction of their tax dollars to be spent for youth soccer, youth baseball, and the other important youth uh, activities that we have. Keep in mind that we only use these fields 10 weeks uh, for our recreational program, 10 weeks out of the whole year. There are other soccer groups using these fields. The other groups using these fields did not really contribute uh, to the $1 million cost uh, plus in-kind contributions. In fact, if you are serious about cost recovery, you should consider um, charging the groups that don't pay any fees on the, based upon using the fields without a reservation. Moreover, let's compare the very small cost of fertilizing, aerating, and seeding these fields, which is the city's key cost in managing these fields on an annual basis, with the huge loss that the city incurs with the sheets of ice down at Lakeview. Keep in mind that we parents at SSA, we line the fields, we supply at our own cost, the goals and the nets, these are not city costs. Finally, keep in mind that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're all volunteers. We have been and will continue to assess our parents 
a fee to help pay back that debt that we still owe the city. Any new increase will discourage participation, will discourage and hurt our scholarship program, which has greatly increased in the last two years. At a time when we want to continue to raise money to pay back that debt. So let's hear from the president of uh, SSA, uh, Jim Mackey. Jim? Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, you allowing us to speak. Um, reading it in the paper, uh, when I talked to the mayor, that was not the way I wanted to, to see how an increase would in incur, but uh, it did, and, and we're here talking to you now. So I'm speaking to you as a as one as a parent of a, a seven-year-old boy that's kicking a soccer ball around the Kaufman. I speak to you as a coach who has, because, uh, well, I'm coaching two teams, both a U6 team at, uh, in Cherry Creek and, and one at, uh, in, at Kaufman, and a fine complex. Uh, I speak to you as a field liner that uh, threw, uh, this morning I was throwing paint and moving nets around. And I'm speaking to you as the uh, Superior Land Soccer President. Um, it's an exciting position. There's a lot of positive things that happen. And uh, I, I'm proud to have this large group of people that, that help make our organization run and, and have a thousand children in the Marquette general area all playing soccer. Um, my main concern is, as the president, I had the final say this year of who would receive a scholarship and who would not. We, uh, Superior Land Soccer utilizes the MAP school lunch program to determine uh, if you qualify for a lunch program or a soccer program. So if you qualified for our, our reduced lunch program, we gave you half off our soccer rates. If you got a full ride, then we gave you, uh, we were able to provide uh, a free scholarship for these kids so they could play soccer. This year we had 75 applicants, which the normal application rate is right around 30. I don't know what caused that uptick. I have no clue why that was. Uh, we weren't able, financially, we, we cannot support that many. Uh, my concern is if this increase, the fee increase for the fields is, is not rescinded, we're going to have to increase our fees by about $5 per player. So currently we're charging uh, $80 for each child to play soccer. Um, so it would go up to 85 What that would do to our, our user base or our kids, I don't know. That would just have to wait until next season when we open the registration. Um, I can only envision more more people applying for that, and we will not be able to just survive to to be able to uh, to service those children, which I don't want to be. I it was a, it was probably the toughest decision of my life. I I've talked to several of you, and I was a paramedic for 30 years, and made a lot of tough calls. But talking to parents on their phone on the phone and telling them their kids wasn't weren't going to be able to play soccer this year wasn't any fun and I didn't enjoy that at all and I certainly am not looking forward to having to increase that and I realize that's kind of a heartstring type of an argument uh, but still one that uh, is fairly realistic and I appreciate your time all right thank you Jim okay commissioners what's your pleasure on this issue Commissioner Ryan I'd like to move we rescind the soccer fee increase that we that was approved by this commission earlier this year. We have support. Commissioner Stonehouse. Commissioner Ryan. Well, I argued against the increase the first time, so I, I feel the same now. You know, I've never played soccer in my life. Uh, I'm not a soccer fan. I don't watch soccer on TV. But I do have two granddaughters that play soccer, and I got exposed to what happens there. It's really an opportunity for a lot of kids to go out and play something healthy. Everybody plays. The little ones don't play very well, but they don't even know that. And they just have a heck of a time. And uh, I think the, the other point that I've made before at this table, you know, we, we're proud of taking credit as a community for all the great things we have. But as I've said before, we only have those things because so many people work to make it happen. We're part of that, but just a small part. But the Superior Land Soccer Association is just a prime model 
of a lot of people, and probably not a lot of people, a fairly small amount of people working hard to, uh, to make this available for these kids. So I would like to see us come back with, uh, with some more statistics on what it's actually costing us to do this. But in the meantime, I'd like to see us rescind these increases. All right, thank you. Commissioner Stonehouse? Well, certainly I, I don't want to echo everything Commissioner Ryan said. Um, I think he hit the mark right on the head. Uh, I would also mention, however, that uh, a previous meeting when the issue came up, I was the one who actually motioned not to increase the fees. So uh, I'm not being inconsistent here at all with, uh, with seconding the motion. I think we have to bear in mind that this was a group that actually built their field. Uh, and that places it a little bit differently than most other sports groups to go in and build the field that they're playing on. And I, I do think that uh, bearing that in mind, uh, that's, uh, that puts them in a very special place. And very much, too, I, I, I think, as Mr. Anderson uh, indicated, they've been coming back regularly giving us money uh, from the investment that we made within the soccer community. So, again, I, I hold that. Uh, I hold all those things very, very important. And as Commissioner Ryan uh, indicated, the youth are the future. And if this is a method that we can help keep them in a, in a, in a healthy environment and all the good things that come from athletics and the supervision, supervision that they're receiving, is certainly something that I can support here. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Schneider? Yeah. Um, I guess I would like to ask staff a few questions to clarify things a little bit. I guess I'm curious to know percentage of use for the SSA versus other organizations that use the fields, um, as well as, you know, if you would just reiterate the justification for the recommendations that we raise the fees almost double in the first place. Sure. And this is something that, uh, and I, you know, appreciate you asking that question and giving us the opportunity to answer it. Um, I guess the first question is Superior Land Soccer probably is the predominant user of the fields at Kaufman Sports Complex. We have three fields there. Um, <clears throat> and we have several user groups that are out there. Uh, Norm Powers is out there uh, with uh, Marquette Soccer uh, Academy as well as the high school. And then uh, a few rec leagues that use uh, those facilities, including perhaps the YMCA, those types of groups. Um, in terms of uh, what percentage is, I can't tell you exactly how many games. I don't have those statistics here, but I certainly can get those for you. I believe I did provide the commission with a memo um, during the budget hearings in which I tried to outline what the costs were or what the revenue streams were going to be based on the increases, and I broke those out with uh, baseball and soccer. Um, in terms of what we do when we set up our our fee structures, it's not based on any single group. What we're looking at is really maintenance and sustainability within our facilities, as you know, and I think the manager outlined in the very beginning of our budget hearings, you know, some of the things that we're going to be dealing with. Um, part of staff's responsibility is looking at how do, we, how do we maintain our facilities and how do we maintain them and be sustainable. Um, you know, in lack of not having a cost recovery plan, which is something that we're going to plan on working on, um, staff uh, has to look at what those numbers are and what we feel is, is justifiable in, in your eyes, and we try to give that to you. Um, and I believe, as Mr. Anderson said, in 2000 there was a $50 maintenance fee that was imposed um, when the city entered into an agreement with the SSA after SSA got the license for the property from the BLP. And that fee pretty much was consistent or didn't, didn't move anywhere uh, for several years. There was actually a register or a, uh, a, res a recreation card that was um, uh, part of the fee structure for about four years and then th when that went away those fees were were put into the actual team fees and so um, it may have looked like an, an, an you know a fee increase but in fact it was just sort of shifting some fees um, I guess it's we did have a meeting with SSA a few weeks ago um, and in those discussions I think we recognize all the great things that they do um, I think they touch a lot of souls in this in this uh, community, including my own kids, when they started soccer. I think it's a great organization. Um, it was our intent at that time to recognize them through a joint use agreement. It was our hopes that uh, we could have gotten to that because I think they are unique, and I think they need to be recognized for the work that they've done, and we thought we could perhaps do that through a joint use agreement um, rather than perhaps, you know, freezing fees or those types of things because there's a lot of groups that are out there that this would impact. Um, so I, I guess, you know, if, if uh, you know, looking at it, and certainly the 
the manager and I haven't had a chance to really look at it and come up with all of our um, ideas for this, but uh, in our initial discussions, it, it, you know, from a staff's perspective, really we thought a joint use agreement might be a good option. Did that answer your questions? What uh, what is a joint use agreement, Carl? If you could. And well, the joint use agreement I think is is looking at Superior Land Soccer Association as a very unique partner um, with our recreation facilities and the soccer facility, and trying to understand what type of investment they've made that is up and beyond the the investment that other um, youth groups maybe may have made that are currently using that facility, and then giving them perhaps some recognition based on fee breaks, those types of things as we move forward. And, and, it, and it also guarantees that, that, that those contributions will continue, whether it be you know, keeping the, the nets up, um, making sure that the goalposts are up so the city doesn't have to make those investments, SSA will make those investments. So you know, trying to create a solid partnership through a, through a joint use agreement. Commissioner St. Ange. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, while I, um, I echo the benefits of youth recreational activities and the benefits that the market community has gained from the Youth Soccer Association and, the, and many of the other uh, youth athletic associations that, uh, that we have in our community, you know, the budget was vetted. We, we talked about this issue at length. Um, it was a specific issue that this commission brought up. Um, we discussed it, we voted on it, and then we took action on the final budget. While there are a great many stories in the community about what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and how much we should spend, at the end of the day, we have to learn to live within our means. We're talking about $5 per student. In, a, in the context, that may not seem like a lot. I don't think that it is. Um, but the budget has been adopted. And if we continue to do business this way and change our minds every time somebody comes to the podium, we're never gonna work our way out of some of the holes that we tend to dig ourselves. So I'm hoping that the commission sticks to its desired and the adopted budget that we have and we move forward on this because if we open the floodgates, who's next? Who's gonna come in here next and ask for another rate reduction? And they're all compelling stories. I, I will give you that. But at the end of the day, we have to learn to pay for what we have. And um, we, we've done so by adopting this budget. Thank you. Commissioner Nimi. Thank you, Your Honor. I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, for Carl, first, uh, Mr. Anderson mentioned some about some teams that perhaps without reservations aren't paying fees or are, are paying fees with, with reservations. I, are, are you aware of that? Are there any groups that use the fields that don't pay pay fees? Well, I think that you know our fields are public fields, and and there are times when you know we may have uh, people out using the fields when we don't know. Um, okay. And so, but anything that's an organized group, we try to uh, certainly, um, especially if they have a you know a contact in these types of things, and they are you know we try to get a hold of them, and 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 certainly. So for instance, uh, there's currently a pickup soccer league. They're probably not paying fees. Perhaps. I think, mm -hmm. on, I think on TV about, some, about a pickup soccer league. Okay. Um, and perhaps a question for Mr. Mackey. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, the, the, the field fee is, is going to put uh, difficulties with your scholarships. Can you, I think in the letter there was a, a, a figure of $1,700 increase from the, the field fee from going from 5 to $10 or 10 to $15? What, what is the fee for the fee per use? That's, uh, I believe that's a per game fee. And yeah. It, it really, it gives Jim, you if, if maybe go to the podium so people can hear you and we can get it recorded. You'll catch me without my post-it notes, so I'm going to go from right. memory, so hold on. <laughs> It's, it's confusing at best because if, if you watch TV, you're looking at soccer on a full field. Superior Land Soccer plays no full fields except for our travel leagues, which play in uh, Chocolate Township. We all play short-sided, which means they play side to side. That allows children to touch the ball more often. The city uh, has a per team fee that we pay 
that would go, go from currently the $60 to 115 and then it has a $5 per home team fee, which in my mind is just easier because I'm kind of simplistic. I was a paramedic, like I told you, I tried to figure out drugs and it wasn't pretty, so I, I kind of shortcutted it a lot. And I'd like to think a lot of people will <laughs> live because of it, but because I wasn't working a calculator. So from my, my standpoint, I look at it rather than a $5 home team i just put it at it caught for every team that takes the field it cost you 250. so we are fielding at kaufman fields this year 59 teams that will play 10 games apiece so 59 teams playing 10 games that's 590 games that are going to take place and then you could take that 590 times two dollars and fifty cents and and that's how you would come up with the per game fee I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can you equate uh, uh, the impact on scholarships that that additional fee that we tacked on for the, the per per team per field? Um, I think it was a figure about seventeen hundred dollars. Can you? Well, I, yeah, I can't without looking at that how we we got there. But the, I I do know we currently have a surcharge uh, over and above what it costs to play soccer of $5 that we, we collect from every child that plays at Superior Land, regardless if they're playing in Chocolate or wherever. But they, they get hit with another $5 to help pay down our city debt, which, which brings in about $6,000 a year. So I'm assuming going with that same number that we, we would be, uh, if we, we get charged at an additional $5, that we're gonna be another $6,000, five to $6,000 it's gonna cost. I don't know, and again, I don't know how that will ultimately impact those children where, because I thought the economy was getting a little better. So where, why there was the uptick this year in, uh, in requests for scholarships, I have no idea. Okay. That answer? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner DiPietro. Thank you, Your Honor. I see in your notes that uh, Little League and PMX use and parents also use the restrooms even though you had approached them to help donate is that correct uh, how did you approach these groups to help uh, donate uh, to this project I didn't approach because I was of course wasn't here as I, I talked about it, uh, previously uh, Bob Anderson was here, so uh, he was involved in that, in the outreach to the other groups, the other user groups. Could you uh, remain up there, and I'll ask Mr. Anderson come up to lectern. I'm assuming then that you had asked these folks to help uh, to this project, to donate to this project. Uh, yes, we did, um, uh, John. We, um, I personally went to uh, four or five Little League uh, meetings to tell them about the proposal for the bathrooms, explain how it was being changed from uh, a $90,000 project to a $500,000 project at the request of the Kaufman Foundation. Um, I went to um, one BMX uh, parent meeting, uh, spoke to their parents on the phone, wrote letters to them. Uh, we had joint meetings with uh, Little League and Hugh Leslie and our parents, uh, about four or five meetings. In fact, they uh, sent Herman uh, over to these joint meetings we had and uh, they initially were supposed to be in and helping us do the fundraising, but at the last minute, uh, Little League backed out. Uh, part of that reason is, of course, is they have their own uh, Spartan bathrooms in the middle of their field out there. Uh, so, but still, their parents enjoy the much nicer bathrooms that we now have. Also, I see that you've got here in the notes that chocolate only charges you forty dollars per season for each field that is correct that is correct forty dollars can, you, can per you 
uh, educate us on how they can do that at that price? Uh, they use their general fund uh, to uh, pay the costs of fertilizing, aerating, uh, which are the two basic costs, um, and that's what they do. Keep in mind that uh, Superior Land Soccer, many years ago, uh, that would have been 14 or 15 years ago, uh, put in, paid for the sprinkler system at both of those Chalkley Township fields. We, I, I personally remember that because I was there with uh, Don Liberty and the other uh, parents. So they are uh, sort of saying thank you to us by only charging $40 per year for those two fields. And they, they have restrooms and all the conveniences out there also. They don't have as good of restrooms as, as we have, you know, at the Kaufman. Uh, they have, um, I think they have a small little restroom in Beaver Grove, um, which is okay. And, and at um, Silver, Silver Creek, they have a small restroom at Silver Creek as well. Okay, thank you. I want to shift over to our Parks and Recreation Director, Carl Suger. Uh, Carl. With this increase, do, are we, is department making money, or are they just breaking even with this rate increase? Yeah, thank you, um, Commissioner. We're, we're far from breaking even, um, and I think we, we spoke to that during the budget hearings, and, um, and that's not, you know, initially our goal is to, you know, it's really to start to eat into some of those maintenance costs and, and you know our maintenance costs at at River Park just for soccer alone is is close to twenty six thousand dollars and th you know the revenues that we anticipate is uh, around eleven thousand eleven thousand a little bit more than eleven thousand uh, just uh, two more questions uh, you don't have uh, Total figures for in-kind service the city is assisting with uh, soccer fields, such as the 20 years at 5,000 per year for maintenance. That was for the restroom facility. I think right. the city, the city uh, made a commitment to um, provide up to $5,000 for the maintenance of the restroom facility. For 20 years? Correct. And then the uh, road going in the back side that was built by the city was all in that was separate buildings yeah. and i don't have that figure but i could get all of that broken okay. out if you'd like it yeah okay i just want to let the residents know that there's a lot of uh, in-kind service being performed also so well the certain uh, the, i mean the city provides all of the maintenance to that facility um you know including um just all the infrastructure from the irrigation system to um, all the mowing, those types of things, and so it's, um, you know, it's 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 the city's responsibility at this point. Okay, that's all I have at this time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I, I'm going to break it down as simple as I can. You know, we just spent about 30 seconds approving the consent agenda, where we spent $867,000 of the taxpayers' money. One item alone on that consent agenda came in $52,000 under budget and we're sitting here wrangling over $3,600 for kids not just kids kids whose parents built the fields kids whose parents are still raising the money to pay off the debt on the fields that they built to provide for the city really my vote's not going to change I supported it last time and failed hopefully we'll support it this time Commissioner Nimi thank you your honor um, you know, you you can't uh, you can't dispute that the SSA has done a, a, a great job for the city. And uh, during budget times, I, I supported the the increase in in the per team fee. Um, I guess we we didn't have much discussion about the field fee, etc. But I, I I can't support this motion. I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Saint Ange that you know we do have we do have needs in the city, and we we have to get revenue. Uh, it's uh, on a percentage basis. It's it's a it's a huge increase 
on a, an actual dollar amount. It's, it's not a large increase per player, although it may be more when, when, you, have, when you talk about the seven, eight player teams versus 10 or, or more player team. But I, if this motion doesn't pass, or if it, if it does pass, we, the fees are moot, but if it doesn't pass, I would uh, think that perhaps what we could do is look at a, a break on the per field fee. Uh, that would be the, the rationale that would, would be in line with the, 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 the value that the Superior Land Soccer Association has provided the city, and certainly I could support something like that. Okay. Commissioner Schneider. Well, um, I'm also going to have to say that I cannot support the motion as it stands. And now that I sound like the bad guy, um, I really want to say that I appreciate what the SSA has done quite a bit and it w I didn't really recognize how much the SSA had put in. And I, I'm not, um, not giving my support to the motion because I want to charge the SSA more. Um, it's because I would prefer to find a way to keep the rates as they are because I really don't think that they're that big of a raise. But I also really would like to find a way to recognize the work the SSA has done so that those fees do not affect uh, the SSA in any way whether it's through credit, whether it's through a joint use agreement, um, whether it's through reduction of some of the fees for the work that, that you've done. Um, I think that we need to recognize that, and I would support any motion that recognizes the SSA for that. But there are user groups that have not put the time and energy into it. And yeah, I think that the fees that, that we've raised um, are really not that unreasonable. And the user groups that haven't put in can pay those fees and the SSA for all of the great work that you guys have done need to be recognized you know this year and for numerous years to come for that work but as the motion stands I don't want to rescind the fees back to what they were uh, Commissioner Ryan I, I agree with the mayor I, I just don't believe we're having this conversation in, in this tone you know everything can't be can't be considered on a business like basis we made a decision a couple of years ago that for groups like the uh, uh, Rotary Club and the Exchange Club to do their projects at Matson Park was worth the effort of the city stepping up and supporting them. We've done that in a number of other cases. What's the difference here? We're, we have to put this on a paying basis? Is this city not willing to sp spend anything for youth recreation? Does it all have to be on a paying basis? I don't get it. I just don't support it. You know, the, the, What's your salary, Jim? Yeah, right. We, we kind of missed the point that there's a group of people who are working to help kids play soccer. Now, you may say it's not much, Jason, but for a family with three kids having to pay 80 bucks a kid, that may, may mean that family can't play, can't play. As far as I'm concerned, you know, the field should be made available, period. You know, we just keep jacking the rates. I, I don't buy it. I, I don't get it. I don't support it. I don't like it. And I don't buy this idea we have to be business-like on, on something of this nature, this nature and this amount of money. It just doesn't make sense. This amount of money is a, is a drop in the bucket to us, but it's a lot to that organization. Thank you. Commissioner Stonehouse? I would, just, I would also suggest that if we really want to look at another, look at another way of, of funding the package, of working with the, the soccer group, we direct staff to do so for next year's budget. But we just solved this problem right now. Let them march on. Let them know what they have. And again, if we need to wrestle to the ground with, with different agreements or different ways of looking at it or different ways of giving credit, we can have the luxury of time to do it for next year's budget the proper way. But right now, this commission, this meeting, this motion, this vote, we do it the right way. Thank you. Any other comments? Jason. Commissioner DiPietro? Yes. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Carl give us his thoughts on this. Thank you. Well, just, just one thing. I just want you to know that these fees won't be imposed until next season, so not until spring of 2013. Just for just so that you have that in your, you know. Um, so right now the rates that they're paying for 2012 is from 2011 also that's correct right these will be in the 2013 spring season well i would like to make a motion that we have a we, we already have a motion okay 
I guess I won't be going there with this, but anyways, one of the things that uh, I hope we can work together on this and figure out where we're going to go for 2013. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Schneider. I said I wasn't going to support the motion, and I'm about to vote yes to support the motion. And it's because of, of what Fred had brought up that we should look at exactly actually how we're dealing with, uh, with the fees with multiple user groups, and especially when one user group has put quite a bit into it. I really, really do not like passing something in a budget, in a vetted process, and then going back on it. Um, you know, that, that's a shame. And I really hope that we don't have to do it again next year. And I really do hope the staff and the commission can deal with, um, you know, how we want to charge user groups for a number of recreational services, not just soccer fields, but how we make that fair for the groups that have put in a lot of time and money and, and still not lose a ton on it. All right. Seeing no other comments, I'll call the question. All in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? No. No. Motion passes. All right, we'll move back to number six, report and recommendation from the city manager <coughs> regarding proposed brownfield plan and Act 381 work plan for 857 West Washington Street. City Clerk. Thank you, Your Honor. Background, the uh, Viridia Group has expressed interest in developing property they own at 857 West Washington Street, the site of the former Sara Lee Bakery. After several discussions with city staff, MBRA representatives, and the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, MEDC, staff from the MEDC told uh, the Viridia Group that they could qualify for a grant or loan through the state, but the but Viridia would have to first have an approved brownfield plan in place to demonstrate the local support for the project. At a special meeting of the MBRA held on May 17, 2012, the MBRA heard a presentation from the Viridia group regarding their proposed mixed-use development. The MBRA voted unanimously to approve the development of a brownfield plan and Act 381 work plan for the Viridia group at 857 West Washington Street and they authorized the authorities brownfield consultant to prepare the draft plans. Public Act 381 requires approval of the brownfield plan by the municipality's brownfield authority and the authority's governing body, the city commission, and if the state's capture is desired, the Act 381 work plan must be approved by the MBRA prior to consideration by the Michigan Economic Growth Alliance or MEGA Board. The MBRA approved the draft brownfield plan, Act 381 uh, plan and Act 381 work plan at their special meeting of June 7, 2012 in order for the MEGA Board to consider the Act 381 work plan at their meeting of August 22nd. The City Commission would need to conduct a public hearing and consider the brownfield plan on June 25, 2012. If the commission approves of scheduling this public hearing, the clerk would need to place notices in the mining journal, notify local taxing jurisdictions, and prepare notices to the MDEQ and the Mega Board. Fiscal effect, as outlined in the uh, draft Brownfield and Act 381 work plans, recommendation. Consider the Viridia Group's draft Brownfield plan and Act 3D work plan for 857 West Washington Street and schedule a public hearing for June 25th, 2012. Alternatives as determined by the Commission. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner Schneider. Just started off and say I would like to make a motion for to schedule a public hearing on June 25th, 2012. Uh, for the Viridia Group's draft brownfield plan and Act 381 work plan for 857 West Washington Street. Thank you. Do we have support? Commissioner Ryan? I'll support the motion. All right. Commissioner Schneider? This is a really big project, and I know that we're tempted to, to really <laughs> start getting into details, but I feel that's what we're scheduling a public hearing for. Um, after uh, our conversation about $3,000 and kids and soccer. I don't really know if it would be fair to Viridia if we really started delving into details on this. I think uh, the perif on periphery, it looks like a really great plan in addition to our community, and I look forward to the public hearing to uh, learn more details and ask nitty-gritty questions then. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> 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 
because that's exactly what we're doing is is you know if, if we vote to schedule a public hearing uh, Commissioner Ryan I agree with Commissioner Snyder uh, I support this idea what I heard tonight I think is very impressive but I think I would save my comments for the public hearing and uh, uh, I'm glad to see we're going to or hopefully we're going to go ahead and have that hearing and I think this is a huge investment in our community and uh, has great promise but we can talk more about it on on the uh, 25th right thank you Commissioner Stonehouse no comment your honor other comment Commissioner Nimi I have a question sure um, perhaps uh, Mac could answer this sure. uh, the question is it, the in your graph you showed the latter years we would be contributing to the local redevelopment fund or revolving redevelopment fund is it in Founders Landing, didn't we take a, a piece of each year in the early years and, and put that into the, the LL or the LRRF? Like about 5% or 10% or 15%? Yes, that's correct. I could, think we, could we also do that in, in this plan? Yes. Okay, because I, I have concerns about the, you know, the, I, I think it's a great project. I, I, I really want to see it go forward, but I also want to see some public benefit from it. The infrastructure improvements, say, I guess my mind, are, are pretty tenuous as, as really benefiting the public, but the, the potential of, of helping to fund our, our uh, revolving fund to, to cover some of our other uh, liabilities we have you know, from, from brownfields would be really uh, attractive. And asking this question next at the public hearing would be too late this way it could you, you could have a chance to kind of look at it and see how we might be able to, to make some changes there yes if we follow that same formula it ramped up a little bit I think we started about two and a half percent or so in year yeah, five or six good, and then ramped fine. up a little bit mm -hmm. over that time to a right. maximum of 10 percent I believe or something like that okay so we could certainly uh, propose that okay right thank you Mac any other questions comments Seeing none, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Number seven, report, in, or report from the city manager, emergency purchase of variable frequency drive units for the Lake Street lift station. City clerk? Yes, Your Honor. Background. <clears throat> the Lake Street lift station is the city of Marquette's largest lift station. The lift station houses three wastewater pumps, each driven by one variable of frequency drive, VFD. At this time, two of the three VFDs are non-operational. This circumstance imposes a serious vulnerability to the integrity of the wastewater conveyance system. While one of the VFDs was sent out for repair in March, a second unit incurred serious damage on May 29, 2012. <clears throat> the unit that was sent out for repair in March has been put on hold due to the high cost of repair. Uh, cost, excuse me, cost proposals for from two VFD manufacturers, Square D and Cutler Hammer, were received on June 1, 2012 to replace the two failed units. An exact replacement of the existing failed units is not recommended or practical since the uh, failed units are no longer manufactured and spare parts are difficult to obtain. The propose proposal being recommended is the Lower cost of the two proposals that are that were evaluated, Wright Electric submitted a proposal for insta installation of the units. Responsible operation of this system requires immediate attention. Failure of the uh, of the last remaining VFD at this lift station would compromise the integrity of the conveyance system. This would result in flooding basements, could result in the flooding of basements and sewerage overflows to streets and waterways per the city code section 3.05 emergency purchases in case of emergen emergency any department head with the approval of the city manager may purchase directly any supplies materials or equipment the immediate procure procurement of which is necessary to the continuation of the work of the department such purchases and the emergency causing them shall be reported in detail to the purchasing agent within a week from the time when made and such reports shall be filed by the purchasing agent as a permanent record. Fiscal effect, a budget adjustment to the FY1112 sewer utility fund in the amount of $14,395 will be required to cover the cost of the purchase and installation of the two VFD units. Recommendation, none at this time. Alternatives as determined by the commission. All right. 
Well, we don't have any recommendations, so <laughs> do, we, do we determine there's anything else we need to do? I'd like to, so. uh, I'd, I'd like to move we, we uh, support city staff for taking the appropriate action and dealing with uh, the situation. Follow the recommendation and yes. do nothing at this time. <laughs> so I'll second that. All right. <laughs> Commissioner Stonehouse? No, uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner Neamey stole my second. All right. So uh, kudos to the staff for reacting to something that needed to be done. That, that so. was really what I was saying. Okay. Let's move to our final agenda item, which is uh, number eight, report and recommendation from the city manager, resolutions for unpaid stormwater and unpaid water and wastewater. Yes, Your Honor, background, chapter 48.194 of the city code states unpaid stormwater service charges shall constitute a lien against the property affected from the date of the, the charges were incurred, charges which have remained unpaid for a period of three months prior to April 1 of any year may, after notice to the owner by resolution of the city commission, be certified to the city assessor who shall place the charges on the city tax roll. Chapter 48.123 of the city code states, charges for water and wastewater services shall constitute a lien against the property served and if not paid within three months after the same as due, the official in charge of the collection thereof shall prior to April 1 and October 1 certify to the city assessor the facts of such delinquency whereupon the city assessor shall enter such delinquent charges upon the next general city tax roll as a charge against such premises and the lien thereof shall be enforced in the same manner as provided by law for delinquent and unpaid taxes. Fiscal effect $1,956.14 plus accruing interest and penalty for delinquent stormwater and $10,558.35 plus accruing interest and penalties for delinquent water and sewer accounts. Recommendation adopt the resolution to place unpaid stormwater, water, and wastewater utility charges on the next city tax roll for collection and authorize the city clerk to sign the resolutions. Alternatives as determined by the commission. All right, thank you, City Clerk. And, and this is the agenda item in which I was responding to earlier where we got the memo from the treasurer just stating that a couple of the figures may have changed uh, just due to the fact that people can come in and pay these at any time and some were paid prior to the meeting but after the agenda was sent out. So uh, with that, commissioners, what is your pleasure? Commissioner Stonehouse. I move to adopt the resolutions to place the unpaid stormwater, water, and wastewater uh, utility charges on the next city tax uh, roll for collection and authorize the city clerk to sign the resolution. Thank you. Do we have support? Sorry. Commissioner DePietro supports. Uh, Commissioner Stonehouse, anything additional? Um, no comment, no. Commissioner DePietro? No, just routine. Thank you. Right. Any other comments? Seeing none, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, now we've got public comment. Comments should be limited to five minutes per person. Anyone wishing to address the commission? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll move to comments by city commissioners. Commissioner Animi? Uh I have nothing this evening, Your Honor. Thank you. Commissioner Schneider? Well, it's been a short, brief, and exciting meeting. Um, I appreciate serving with all of you despite some of the differences of opinions. I guess you can now officially call me a flip-flopper on this. Um, I hope that next year's budget, um, we can find a way of dealing with it, with user fees in general for, for a lot of our recreational activities because it's something that you know, no matter what the recreational activity is, I don't really think we'll ever be able to break even. So we're always going to be at a loss on those. It's just a matter of finding out what kind of loss we're, we're willing to take as a community and, and how we can charge user groups fairly, especially when we've got user groups that are <coughs> putting a lot of money into it. Thank you. Commissioner St. Ange? Nothing, Your Honor. Commissioner DePietro? Thank you, Your Honor. Got some uh, congratulations and kudos to city employees. Uh, Pam Greenleaf, administrative assistant, will on june 16th we'll have her 25 years in and mark spatton 
water treatment plan operator uh, on June 14th will have his 15 years in. Also, uh, we got uh, four city employees retiring on June the 15th. One is public works employee Pat Fluett. After nearly 27 years of service, which Pat began his career in 1985 as a career as a laborer. In 1987, promoted to uh, meter service crew leader in the water distribution division. And Pat had worked his way through the S3 water work system operator certification from the DEQ as a uh, service specialist. Pat traveled throughout the city installing, reading, wiring, and servicing water meters at every resident in the city of Marquette. Also retiring on June the 15th will be uh, Public Works employee Sharon Fluett, who after 29 years and nine months of service, Sharon will, was hired as a city typist uh, at the Lakeview in 1982, she worked at the Lakeview Arena for 18 years and then posted to Public Works for the last 12 as administrative assistant for the department providing administrative customer service and payroll support. And from Park and Rec, we have Frank Starr re retiring on June the 15th. Um, after 28 years and 10 months of service, Frank, Frank began his career at the City of Marquette in st September 83 as a laborer. In 1985, was promoted to maintenance carpenter, and with Frank's skills as outstanding carpenter, uh, worked as throughout the City Hall and many other city f uh, facilities. And last but not least, on June the 15th, executive assistant to our city manager, Darlene Inch. After six years, 10 months of service, Darlene is retiring. She worked as director for Ishmael and Lagani Chamber of Commerce and as a community relation, relation uh, coordinator for the YMCA of Marquette County before joining the city. So anyways, I'd like to really thank all these very fine employees, outstanding employees for their years of service. So thank you uh, employees and enjoy your time at camp and fishing and whatever you do. Also, I'd like to uh, remind everyone of the upcoming Model A 2012 National Convention being held from June 18th through June 22nd. Um, over 100 Malloways from every state in the U.S., Canada, and some from countries overseas will be here uh, for this uh, national convention. So look at the itinerary. If you have any questions about the events that are going to be uh, happening, you can call the Downtown Development Authority at 228-9475. Get an update on whatever is occurring. And... Finally, at this time, I and my fellow commissioners would like to thank Marquette's City Fire Department, City Police Department, Public Works personnel on the Market Board of Light and Power personnel on their quick response during Friday's devastating high winds clocked at over 60 miles per hour. With heavy rain, downpour, and golf size, golf ball size hail, and wet winds uh, still uh, top in 60 miles per hour, trees tumbled onto city streets, flooding many major and local streets with several inches of water, causing flooding and hazardous driving conditions. While all the city department employees were responding to these major issues, they had also encountered many flying debris and other objects that the wind was blowing around. Again, we commend these public works employees, city fire, police department, and Light and Power for responding to the severe weather incidents of last Friday. And during city manager's comment, I'd like him to announce when his next 
community office hours, date, and location will be. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Commissioner Ryan? I'd just like to say it was very exciting to hear the plans of uh, Viridia for uh, development on Washington Street in Marquette. It remains to be seen what role the city will play, but I, I believe the city staff has been encouraging and supportive uh, of people making this investment in our community. And anytime someone uh, wants to invest 30 plus million dollars, that's, that's pretty outstanding. It was also uh, pretty fascinating to uh, get the update from Marcus Robbins on the NMU archives. I think that's going to be uh, very interesting for a lot of people, an opportunity to go back and see what commissions have done all the way back to 1868. This is really pretty fascinating stuff, and it's amazing what can be done today. And it's good that Northern has taken the lead on this uh, project uh, with the city of Marquette and uh, Marquette County, and hopefully with some other uh, communities in the future as well. So I, I think it was very interesting to hear about that. And uh, like the mayor, I want to go home and see if I can take a look at it myself. All right, thank you. Commissioner Stonehouse? Boy, just to, uh, to kind of jump on that a little bit, it, it really is, is all the more fascinating that it's so up to date. In other words, the, the minutes of this meeting link to it as, as quickly as we can do that. So when we talk about transparency in government, uh, certainly this is a major step forward in doing that, and, and especially in a searchable uh, arena. Let me, uh, let me really get a little different here and, and talk about something uh, that's going to happen with the Model A Convention that's not receiving a great deal of support, and it really should be. Uh, most of the activities with the Model A's are, are really directed at the club proper. It is a car club, and, and the events are for their members. Uh, not, not, this, uh, not to not say that there will be, will be many of them visible to, to everybody. But one that particularly is, 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 I think, very important to all of us is actually a vintage fashion show that is being put on by the Market Beautification Committee. They're doing that on Thursday, June 21, starting 1 o'clock in Upfront and Company. Uh, tickets for it are $25. Uh, it's, uh, they're really, really encouraging the pre-sale of those tickets because they need to, to lay on the food uh, and know how many people are coming. But here's the real value of it. The money they raise will be going towards the restoration of the Father Marquette statue. And that's the statue that's in front of the old Lake Superior Partnership building up on the hill. And it, it really is, a, is in dire need of work. And the Beautification Committee has taken on the role of, of getting this done. And one of the methods they're using is this fashion show of, of period fashion from Henry and, uh, and Clara's era to help pay for it. So I encourage everybody to think about attending if they can and participating in this great, very unique event, uh, the funding of which is, is really for our own Marquette community. So uh, tickets are available at the Marquette County Visitors uh, uh, Convention, uh, yeah, the Marquette Visitors and Conventions Bureau at the DDA uh, downtown, as well certainly as uh, from members of the uh, uh, Beautification Committee itself. Uh, uh, nothing further, Your Honor, thank you. All right, thank you, I've got a few brief ones. I want to thank uh, the Mayor Pro Tem for uh, acting as the chair at the last meeting as I was out of town. I watched the video and you did a fine job, so thank you. Uh, I want to congratulate a good friend, uh, Cindy DiPietro, on being named MAPS uh, Teacher of the Year this year. So very well deserving for those that know Cindy and the work she does at the Alternative High School. So, uh, And last but not least, I'll, I'll reiterate something the Mayor Pro Tem said and that's one of the retirements and that's of Miss Darlene Inch. Uh, we have a lot of great employees here at the city that come and go but very few that we as a commission get to deal with on really a daily basis and, and Darlene has been a fantastic employee, uh, does a remarkable job and we'll all miss her uh, but we wish her the best. So with that city manager. Thank you, Your Honor. And uh, really only two things this evening. One, to thank everybody who's participated in the community master planning kickoff. We got some great feedback from the community uh, that we're going to be tallying up shortly and putting on our website. Uh, we want to remind everybody that was really just the kickoff. There's going to be lots of opportunities to participate through the summer through a variety of different uh, town hall meetings and other activities that we have planned. So we'd like people to stay focused on that and help us make this the best master plan that we can possibly make it. Uh, also, pursuant to the Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Wednesday at 10 to 12 in the Peter White Public Library Public Conference Room, we'll be having our next community office hours. Uh, we encourage everybody to come down and uh, let us know how we're doing. And that's right. it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. With that, we're adjourned.